Welcome to the OFX Podcast. I'm Dave Claxon. Along with me is the top 20 teetering titan, Bethany McChesney. <laughs> it's right on the edge, right there. Just right there. <laughs> we need to go around and just, you know, do some Nancy Kerrigan work just to make sure you get into worlds and we'll be good no. to go. <laughs> That'd be awesome. But no, you're okay. So here it is. You are there. I right? am. Are there. Just so if it wasn't for Orlando still happening, you'd be very safe. But I, I mean, we'll see. I I think there was I think I think you'll get it because I think there'll be a roll down and I'm looking at some and I'm thinking there'll be some some people that will not be going. Mm -hmm. Um so I think I think odds are in your favor. Yeah. I mean, we said it from the beginning. We thought 3630 would make it. And that was kind of in my range of abilities. And I snuck under 3630. So I kind of like I did what I got to do. So now the rest is up to fate. And we'll see what happens in Orlando. And still hoping to be in that uh, elite group of top 20. So I really, really cool. like I really wanted to be like, top 20 and not like roll down top 20 but <laughs> and right now you are right now you are top I am right now top 20 <laughs> yeah so anyway as we did we were down we did deca fit in uh philly well not quite philly philly-esque ish ish philly-ish yeah. it would be like the equivalent of doing it in what like um the gta like the like philly... georgetown yeah <laughs> you know something like that or, or whitby mm -hmm. It was much prettier than Whitby, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So, how was your run? Like, it was great. Did it, you? You look tactical. Like, I got to, I got to rabbit. You looked like you were tactical. Yeah. Well, like I'm lining up with like Meg Jacoby and Chris Roglowski and Vivian Tufudo. So all these and Alondra Greenley. So, like, I know these women are just like minutes faster than me in the fit. So I just I. And I am one to get really excited about racing and go out too hot. I just, I, it's just me. So I knew I really had to shut it out a bit with um, racing those girls. Um, and just knowing like, I'm not, I'm not where they are when it comes to machines. So I have to let them go and be okay with it. So I had to be tactical and run my own race because it's too easy in in these decorations to go out hot because you feel good and then you pay for it later and then all of a sudden you have a three, three and a half minute bike and your race is over. So um, I had to run super tactical um, and I just, running your own race is really difficult when there's you're in a race with 12 women who are some of the best in the world. Um, and so to be, you know, 10th in your heat and still run 45 second personal best, it's in some ways it feels like, you know, I got smashed Meg, but Meg Jacoby ran a world record and, you know, Chris ran a PB, Vivian ran a 40 second PB and all these girls are running personal best. So um, to have to shut that all out and really run my own race, still run a 42 second personal best. Uh, it did take a lot of um, mental, mental fortitude to just like hit your splits. And I know, I know what I have to do in my stations to run a 35, 36, 30. Um, and then my running is, I'm, I'm like a metronome when it comes to hitting certain splits with running. So I just kind of did it. And I mean, it feels very, um, mechanical in a sense that like, just hit your splits, but I like, it was like, just run your 3630. And that's exactly what I did, 3626. So, um, and it, as we just hope that would be in the top 20 and I'm 20th. So it was kind of like, just do exactly what you have to do. And sometimes when you take the emotion out of racing, um, it just, it feels different. But I mean, it's, it's not to say that that was easy. Mentally, it was difficult, but in different ways. So yeah, that was kind of how my race went. And it's interesting too, because there's always races within the race. So I kind of knew also the girls that would be running around me. So then that becomes my race. So for me, it was Michelle Navarro and then uh, Laura Winkleman. And so those ladies were kind of within my realm. So you end up racing 
different people. And then like Carly Wolpat was around me, but her strengths are dramatically opposite of mine. So there's these like huge shifts that happen also within the race. So it's kind of what makes uh, Decca really interesting. But yeah, so that's kind of how the race went. It was it was good. And then when we were when when I was run run with you, you know, when I'd see you on the course too. And every time I saw you, like I said the same thing, just do you run your race. Run run your race. Ignore yeah. everything else. And and I don't feel bad saying that because I'm I don't I'm the this thing we talk, we mentioned this later on with our guest, but it's uh you know, as a rabbit, you get out there and you're like, you're not allowed or you shouldn't be allowed. There's no rules. Nobody has any rules, but I have my own set of rules where I'm you shouldn't be giving information to the racers. Mm-hmm. but to cheer them on is okay so to 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 say race within yourself do that yeah. stuff that's that's all right but and like we we talk about this too but hybrid racing is so cool in that uh like you can have athletes that are, have such dramatic different strengths so for me to say like run your own race Beth and someone else run their own race and we could end up with very similar times, but like someone could be a 25 minute 5k girl, someone could be an 18 minute 5k girl and you kind of end up in the same in the burpee pit at the same point at the very end because you've run totally different races, but your strengths kind of, you know, all they mush together and then you end up at the finish line at the same spot. It's just it's so interesting in hybrid racing, especially the fit, because it's probably the one where it is half running, half stations, like for the equal amount. Um, so the like the mix of the runners and the strength people combined makes it a really cool race. So like me running my own race, Carly Wolpat running her own race or like Alondra Greenlee, um, it, it looks very different and there's so much shifting that happens in it. It was it was an exciting race to watch. It was really good. Um, if you haven't seen it, check it out on the OCR report, and you can still watch it over there. But it was a it was a great race, both the men's and the women's. Um, but it does bring up, and like we talked about the what well, you sitting in twentieth, and it brings up one of our favorite sticking points with Deca, is that if you don't make the top twenty, that should count to age. It's, mm-hmm. it's no sense otherwise. Because I'm thinking of I'm looking at yourself. Uh, Michelle Navarro, Julie Best, right there on the edge. And it's, sh- there's no reason. This sh- we don't get it. We don't get it. I will never get it. I've, I've even had it explained to me and I will not get it. I refuse. <laughs> I refuse to bend or break or understand. Yeah. I will never, I will never agree with this rule. Yeah. So in the strong and in the mile, you don't have to pick age group or elite, but in, in the fit you do. So girls like Michelle Navarro, she was in the top 12 last year for uh the world championship so she would of course race elite um in her fit so right now she is not in the top 20 and unless she gets a roll down spot um she has not raced as far as i know an age group deca fit which no. means come time to world championships uh she does not have a spot on a start line for the deca fit even though michelle navarro is one of the best deca fit racers in the world, she's just not in the top 20. So she is not eligible to race an age group race either, which to me just is completely wrong. Same with Julie Best. And um, who, again, she's new to the hybrid racing scene, uh, but she's proven herself to be one of the best fit racers and didn't get in that top 20 this weekend. Um, didn't run an age group race. And the thing too is, so my biggest, the so the uh i guess the solution that uh deca has given me is well if you're on if you're a bubble kind of athlete then race an elite race and an age group race even in the same day and you'll probably be fine okay but i also really like race i race the team race also so now you want me to run three races in one day um and the fit is not like racing a mile or a strong like it's it's a it's more, a little bit more of a significant race um to solidify my spot but you're you're literally asking me to run the exact same race twice just registering in different categories yeah to get my spot so re- what you're saying is you want me to pay twice to run the exact same race the second time just more fatigued um which just it makes no sense to me whatsoever so Based on their system, there is going to be people who are 
very good deck of fit racers who will not be racing any race at the world championships because of the system. And I think it just makes no sense whatsoever. No, this isn't, I've yet to hear the logical argument and I still won't. And I'm sorry, Yancey. I know we, we, we love Yancey and we agree with him on a great many things, but this one, we are just on opposite sides of the fence and I don't think it's going to change. Um, <laughs> another thing too, that comes up as, as I'm watching as well is, or as we're watching, as we're racing and thinking about is uh, another rule, which I call the McChesney rule, um, <laughs> is that if you qualify with one relay partner, you're not allowed to have a substitution for injury or any reason right now. And I'm looking at that and I still think that that is, at least I understand the logic behind that rule. I don't agree with it. I understand it, but I put it out there and I've said this before that you have people who have raced, raced an event like let's, all right, let's put this out there. So Tara Jackson and I, we have a qualifying time, right? Let's say that Tara actually want, like, we're not planning to run. Tara's focused on the individuals. It's never always a plan for us to run. But let's just, for argument's sake, say it was. And then I get injured. All of a sudden, Tara Jackson can't run in the relay because I got injured. I can't be substituted. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't that's not fair. That doesn't make sense. And yeah. from a business perspective, let's say on a different side, let's say instead of running with Tara, let's say I ran with Tia Toomey. Yeah. And then I got injured and now Tia Toomey can't be there to, to be part of your event because she can't have a substitute. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't get it. I just, I don't understand in a team, in a relay, not being able to substitute the player. People are like, well, they didn't qualify, and well, then you're just going to bring in a ringer. Well, it's the world freaking championships. You're supposed to be bringing the best team. Qualification systems are to keep out the teams that aren't good enough, not to stop the teams that are good enough from running. Mm -hmm. So, again, two, two things that both got in our heads this weekend. Yeah, and I mean, like, you joke about it being the McChesney rule, but legitimately, yeah. <laughs> like, I qualified with my friend who very legitimately broke her foot and I had to replace her. Like, it wasn't like I made, had this, like, scheme to bring in, like, qualify and then bring in a ringer. Like, so, um, but yeah, but the thing, too, is this – this happens in all sports where there's team components. And if you have to substitute out someone, it's allowed. So with, with DECA, 50% of your team still exists. Yeah. So it's not like your team is completely dramatically different. 50% of your team is still there. And then you bring in a different person. Um, so it, like I just, again, it should be allowed. Um, I, I wonder though, if, it could be even that your person has to have run a DECA event ever. Mm. So like I couldn't call up my buddy Tia Toomey and be like, which she's not, but I'm joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe. Um, and be like, Hey, come and smash some machines with me. You know? So if, if she's had, you know, she's having to prove herself as a DECA athlete at some point, then maybe that should be the rule. Like a little bit of an in-between here where if they're trying to prevent you bringing in a ringer, um, then at least someone who has a result at some point in DECA could maybe be the um, like the in-between here. Um, but yeah, I don't agree that you can't change your team at all because there is the situations with injury. And we do want people being able to compete at world championships if they've qualified themselves. And it's not fair necessarily for one person if their partner gets injured that then they just can't go. And if you've kind of based your season around this, then I mean that does really suck. So yeah, and again, this is this is this is let's be honest, this is not, you know, the NBA. This is not the Olympics. This is not at mm -hmm. that level as of yet. No. You don't want to be cutting people out. You want to make sure as many people can that you know can go go. You, yeah. So and bringing in some big names from other sports is kind of cool too because you're exposing completely different worlds to our sport, which is also pretty awesome. 
Yeah, and I mean, like, even this weekend, like, Matt Stankovich, having him here, there, like, he was in Deck of Worlds last year, but even, you know, former mm. NFL player causes a scene. Every time uh, Kurt Majit shows up, you know, it it causes a stir. Well, he uh, caused the scene. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> are, we talk, are we talking about that one? <laughs> anyway. Emotions flare during competition. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and um max fennel i mean max fennel was there this weekend it's always good to see him there by the way he people don't talk enough about max fennel you know he's come over from triathlon he's legit bought into deca he he might not be top mm -hmm. of the pyramid but he competes hard and he keeps coming out and uh, i love seeing him out there mm -hmm. you know so good for you hopefully we see more of max fennel and hopefully he, he you know I, I don't think he's got a qualifying time for worlds but whatever mm -hmm. yeah maybe he'll get a good relay partner we go. yeah maybe tia to because apparently she's available <laughs> is she not pregnant or had another baby i don't know i don't know emily I rolf guess. she's fast yes emily rolf would be a good mm -hmm. emily rolf would be awesome to see you do a deck of fit yeah well i mean there's a couple crossfitters who i think should come over and smash a deck of fit but who, who do you think would be best like i think i would I'd go to obviously i go to emily rolf and emma lawson oh i'd love to see it yeah emma lawson do one for sure yeah Mm -hmm. yeah that would be that would be very interesting It'd be kind of cool um we're not gonna go too much about high rocks and stuff in there but anyway, more about more about the deck so then you did your relay you had your relay with heather defending <laughs> world champions back on the back on the course mm -hmm. yeah we were both kind of moody <laughs> about it <laughs> so like heather's been training for an ultra um and did not taper for this weekend at all so she was not looking forward to the relay um and like i felt a little bit beat up too so we we're both kind of moody and uh <laughs> and you did both already run a race that day we did both run our deck of fits earlier that day um so yeah we were just like our kind of pep talk was like we just got to qualify right yeah we just got to qualify <laughs> and then but it was fun because we got to race you and Jeff um but yeah I think so from the very first 500 meter when Heather's like Beth you gotta slow down I'm definitely <laughs> <laughs> like right from the beginning and her role was a little bit off and then um yeah like every every station was a struggle in some way and it was probably the most suffering I've been through and I think same with her, like she was shaking her head at some stations, <laughs> like the ball over her shoulders. She's just shaking her head. And uh, the very last 500, um, I'm like, hey, Heather, just give me a little bit. And I pull like a couple of meters ahead of her. She's like, eh, Beth, <laughs> come back. <laughs> okay. So, but anyways, we finished after much suffering. And we were only 10 seconds off our time at world. So we were actually quite thrilled with that, to be honest. Um, but it was much more suffering, I think, than we really wanted it to be. But we solidified our spot <laughs> despite um, much whining and complaining throughout. But <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun to get to race you guys, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, and like you said to, to Heather, um. So after we're, we're wait, we're sitting, her and I are both sitting on the, essentially we mirror the same techniques that are the same strategies. And uh, so Heather and I are sitting on the rowers waiting to get tagged. And I don't remember exactly what I said to her, but it was something like, you ready to go or let's go or something like that. And she's just like, oh, I feel like crap. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I could, I knew she felt like crap right from the lunges. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just I I did the best I could on the runs to try to make up for maybe what she might have lost. And she's Heather is a phenomenal athlete, and oh. she's super, super stubborn. Um, so I also knew she wasn't gonna let our team down, and vice versa. So we just we suffered together, and we pulled it off. So no, and to think that you know you put in that time on let's definitely call it less than ideal circumstances mm -hmm. does bode well for going into worlds and and you know trying to defend the title so mm -hmm. i remember mm -hmm. even so the third station is box over is i remember thinking slow down heather i need more rest <laughs> slow down stop doing it so fast 
I just need a couple more seconds. But like, I don't remember doing DECA fit relay before and thinking like, why are you so damn fast, Heather? Like, don't do the station so fast. Like, I just need a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was good. You guys were, you guys were great, but you, and you took the win. You guys had another, uh, another win under your belt. So mm -hmm. yeah. it is, it is good going into Texas. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it was, it was just such a fun ride. And, and so we, we talked about, we, we ended up racing in the second wave. Uh, you get, they had you guys in and then they pretty much just, put you guys with the second wave of men and, and, and some high-end teams yeah, yeah. and uh, we went out with it and we noticed like it ended up being this kind of canadian wave there was like four mm -hmm. canadian teams in there and we had a great time um definitely have to shout out amber and zach uh, tate who put in like, just a killer time um amber on a uh, one and a half legs you know yeah. after falling off the box over which we know and she has admitted is a bit of a humbling experience for mm -hmm. uh, someone who has done so good with the box overs publicly mm -hmm. and to fall on it but as she said she's still got a 30 second box over. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah but um yeah they, they did a great job and along with the rest of their pure pure impact crew is great mm -hmm. we had other canadian content with con content with uh isaac sanderson who we'll be talking to later and um Formerly Susan McFarlane. Now it's Susan. Snicky. Snicky. Susan, who did a great job. She ran two races, didn't she? So Susan, uh, yeah, she ran age group and um, missed two laps. So got a 10 minute penalty. So then jumped into another race later uh, to try to get a spot so that she could potentially have the opportunity to go to worlds and like she will be fine in her age group to race at worlds but um yeah kind of a tough way to do it so admittedly she gets some very serious race brain which is a very real thing yep. um yeah so missed two laps had to redo it it is what it is yep yep but it was good it was um it was a great race it was another great event uh team effects boy dylan scott Mm -hmm. down i mean pr first time and uh i think this makes him the fifth man to go sub 30 mm -hmm. and he in an, another a fairly stacked men's field uh, so it was dylan and Makita and then Riker on the dylan Riker and then Makita on the podium yeah um, all all great races like mm -hmm. dylan just had it off the start to start like as in was going up to start he was pushing rich from the for the first half and then took over and just and just gapped the field. Um, Nick Riker, who has gone from a guy who used to just charge out and then bleed and fade away to this cerebral racer who is now dialed in. And I think the, his past three races have all been within like five, 10 seconds of each other. Yeah. He is, he's that, that dialed 20 in. mark. Yeah. Yeah. Which now is the thing that he has to try to overcome. He's got to, he's got to get that one step further to get that sub 30. And then Megita, who did his hang back technique again and waited and waited and waited and went from at times, I think sixth or seventh, and then ended up on the button when it all said and done on the podium. Yeah. And, and admittedly, who is not at his peak fitness. No. So if this is Megita not at peak fitness, then look out too. So he's still kind of struggling with that back injury that he had at Worlds by Rock. So uh, not, he says, training at about 50% capacity. So, and then on the other end uh, of it would be Rich Ryan, who probably came in as the pre-race favorite. Yeah. And let's just face it, he 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 had a day where he he laid an egg. It just wasn't yeah. wasn't in him for today for that day, and he went out pretty good. But mm -hmm. you could tell that even though he was going pretty hot, he still wasn't quite all the way there. Like he was leading. Until I believe the the med ball sit ups, I think Dylan overtook him on the skier pretty commandingly. Yeah, well he went in he went into the med ball sit ups first. Dylan made a little pass right at the med ball sit ups, right going in, and then Rich passed Dylan during the sit ups and came out after. And then yeah, on the skier that's where Dylan really really made his move move. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, there was just no Dylan just kept rolling, and he he looked at no point did he look concerned or yeah. didn't look fresh as a daisy like he was rocking the whole race through mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, and like as we know, Rich is really focused on High Rock Spain right now, so it could have played into um, his top end a little bit. Maybe, maybe, but again, maybe uh, to Rich's, you know, and he can be optimistic as this is very similar to how he went into last year. Mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't uh, wasn't quite. You now he was seated seventh, I believe, and then ended up taking it all at Worlds. The only thing this time is, I think right now he's seated. 11th or 10th or whatever so he might get bumped into that second wave yeah or so and i don't think he has plans to go to orlando but even still i mean he's still putting on a 31 something which just shows that rich shitting the bed is still pretty freaking amazing <laughs> yeah so, mm -hmm. it's good stuff and then we would be remiss to not talk about uh, meg jacoby who had yeah. a pretty good day an okay day mm, just casually set a world record but... actually she casually set two world records yeah, she did. <laughs> as did as did Rich got in on that one too. But um yeah, the first one, um I don't think I've seen well, here's the thing. Everybody was talking about what an amazing women's field this was going into the race. And then to see one woman just just dominate it. She had a little push around the bike from Vivian, but I mean not not a realistic attempt at a pass or anything like that just a little a little push and then just took off it was it was impressive to see yeah i mean i i, I chatted with meg a fair bit after and like she knew she knew she was fully capable of it and she didn't wear a watch she didn't work out splits she just did what meg does and she ran within her abilities and took the world record she's she's running very well right now um and obviously her machine work is fantastic and yeah she just she knew she could do it and she just basically executed so yeah and then uh and then she went on to race with her and rich to mm -hmm. do the mixed mixed relay and they were competing with Megita and eric williams and dylan and matt and they were unbelievably fast. Like they weren't, they mm -hmm. were not far off Megita or sorry, not far off of uh, Ryan Kent and Rich Ryan's time. Like they were, so Megan Rich were, was a second or third overall with the men's teams. Yeah, I think so. Third overall, third overall. Yeah. So yeah. They were so, yeah. And I mean, again, back to the women's race too, Meg pulled Vivian to a 30 second PB and Roglowski to a 20 second PB and Alondra to so there were six six women in that heat who this was their first deck of fit of the year not that it was not their first deck of fit ever uh just that's just Meg and Carly but uh multiple women ran personal bests um just kind of chasing Meg down Vivian a huge race um and was really pushing meg so yeah it was it was quite the race for the women uh, um yeah a lot of them just smashed that course so to be in that race <laughs> was very humbling <laughs> yeah and i've said this about vivian for a while that she just keeps leveling up slowly but surely and mm. she, i think she's just going to continue she yeah she yeah. threw down on the bike she was she put down the same time as Meg and Carly Wolpat. Actually, she was a little faster than Meg. I think she was like five seconds. One second. One second? Was it one second? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> hey, yeah. a win's a win. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, she is a phenomenal athlete and is constantly underestimated. And she's just amazing. Just an amazing person. Um, there was another record set and doesn't get near as much talk, but Jarrett Newby set the Go Ruck Deca record. Hmm. and again i don't think he just said it i think he smashed it but as of course like if you put if you put 30 pounds on jared newby's back he's not even going to be aware of it like <laughs> yeah yeah like i mean he's he, what did he run that uh half marathon with 100 pounds or what i don't know some crazy crap whatever he's done yeah but... 50 pounds and i think his half marathon time was like 137 yeah 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 he's like smoking most people's regular regular times without any weight on and so the guy's just, when it comes to rucking and running, I, there's nobody in his league. Yeah, so, great. Mm -hmm. It was good. And, and that was his first deck, and he put it on again. A lot of first deck is a lot of great time, good times, mm -hmm. and excellent performances. All in all, it was, it was a good event. Like, it was great. Um, 
there was other stuff to talk about today, but we don't have time because we have a guest. We got other things to do to get through. Um, but yeah, all in all, Decker put on another great race. Philly was a, a, a good venue. Um, oh, and one more thing. I did. I mean, we mentioned her a couple times, but Carly Wolpat and she she surprised me mm. with just. I did not think she would put in the time she did. I thought the running would be too much for her and totally wrong. She ran the smart race, waited, played her strengths, you know, laid that trump card down when it was time to do it. And yeah, yeah and she had a great run and she'll be she'll be at Worlds. And that's fantastic. I think yeah. she I think did run good. smart. I so before going into it, I thought if Carly goes out trying to run with the top girls, it's not going to go well, but she, she put herself right at the back of the starting trail and uh, hung back and kind of waited to that, the station seven on, which is our, the power stations and then just drop the hammer on that bike and then game over for her. So. Oh Smart. yeah. Yeah. Her and, uh, and, and Lauren, Lauren, Lori Winkleman, uh, I mean, one of my favorites watching her go, she's just, you know, another one for the 40 plus crowd. <laughs> yeah. but she's she does the same thing right you, you she's like oh where is she where is she where is she oh oh there, oh there she is she's like fifth sixth she's right there yeah mm -hmm. so another great power athlete um mm -hmm. anyway so yeah um not a lot of time so we're gonna get to it and i'm gonna do the part that i'm really terrible at which is introducing guests so here we go isaac sanderson yeah let's go all right so isaac sanderson Welcome. Yeah, I suppose I'm supposed to say welcome. That's that's the polite way to do things, isn't it? Yeah, thanks. So how'd you recover from your trip? Are you home? Are you back? Yeah, back in Canada now. Are you guys back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we did the did you guys drive down? Because we did the drive. Uh so I was out in Utah. So I flew in. Um I actually flew into New York or New Jersey. My mom came and picked me up and then we drove to Oaks together and then we drove back uh, sorry, she drove back home like the same night. So I had some McDonald's and fell asleep, and she drove home in six hours. So it was really, really nice of her. Hey, what are you, like seven? What am I, seven? No. Yeah, like seven years old. Your mom picked you up some McDonald's and drove you home? I was really sweet. I didn't, I didn't see her in four months. It was awesome. <laughs> That's all right. It was, it's not a bad drive. It wasn't a bad drive. But um, so you were out in Utah. You were out in Utah. And, you know, I'm, maybe we'll get to this. Later. Actually, let's go back a bit. Let's go back a bit. So first time. You kind of appeared on my radar anyway. Maybe Bethany is as different. Is I was starting to see you crop up in some of the Spartan Race Canada standings. Mm -hmm. So now we say, oh, the new guy on the scene, Isaac Sanderson. So how did you get into Spartan? How did you get started? Um, it started for me. Sorry, I think I figured out a date here. I think in the summer when COVID was really bad, when everything was shut down. Um, I lived in a house in university with five other guys. Um, who are all pretty fit, pretty athletic, who just wanted to do some challenging or hard things. So we did that, the, what was it called? The four by four every four hours, or four kilometers every four hours, 48 hours, we did that thing. And then one of them wanted to do a Spartan race. And I didn't, I haven't heard of it before, um, but it sounded cool. So I, we, we hopped into one. Uh, we were hoping to do, or I was hoping to do uh, like the beast or something, but my one roommate wanted to do the ultra. So my first introduction to Spartan race was actually the blue mountain ultra in 2021. Um, and it didn't go very well, like time wise or placement wise. I think I was on the hill for 11 and a half, 12 hours. Um, yeah. <laughs> had a lot of like, um, ups and downs, a lot of walking, a lot of sitting on the hill, kind of regretting it, but, but finishing, uh, and strangely enough, that's kind of when I enjoy or when I fell in love with like the obstacles and running and kind of mixing some athleticism into running. Uh, and then from there, I just kind of dedicated some time throughout my university, like my last year of university into training. So I uh, um, kind of just trained more for uh, the trail running scene and then lifted some weights every once in a while. I had no structured plan. I just kind of wanted to more look the part, like try to fit in with the elite athletes and more kind of morph my body into that kind of body type. Uh, and then did, did some age group races and then uh brendan neely who you guys you guys know quite well um kind of took me under his wing and uh encouraged me along and um, helped me with some training and did some training camps with him and um it was great for my development and uh yeah popped on the scene elite and 
I've uh, been trying to compete ever since. So you say you, you just jumped, jumped to the altar and you guys were roommates, pretty athletic. Like, uh, uh, yeah. You know, so I was a young guy. I thought I was pretty athletic. But I wasn't ready to just jump in an altar and cry on the side of the mountain forever. Like I would, I would die. And I mean, definitely. So, so what, what did you do for a background? Um, my background's in a lot of different sports. So I had a twin brother growing up and some pretty awesome parents who didn't say no a lot when it came to sports, um, at least. So I've, I've played competitive basketball, soccer, volleyball, hockey, um, predominantly hockey until I was about in grade 10. And then I transitioned to basketball kind of full time from grade 10 on, uh, like my grade 10, 11, 12, and then I stayed a fifth year as well. So four straight years of basketball kind of full-time. Um, and then at university, um, I decided to play on the ultimate Frisbee team. Didn't play any um, like collegiate or university sports. Didn't do running there. Didn't play basketball there. Just did an ultimate Frisbee because it was fun. Hadn't played before, but I just like those tryouts to the team. So I tried out, made it, uh, and played for three or four years with them. Um but yeah, my background is not really focused or specified on one certain thing. Um, I kind of like to do it all. I have a very like kind of scattered brain. I can't focus on things like very, um, very well for like a long period of time. I have like my brain just drifts and I want to try new things. Hence the now that I'm in the hybrid scene. So that's kind of the general background. I I had a friend actually who got really into the ultimate frisbee scene when we were in university. Um, I ran track with her and then she kind of got fed up with some things, went into ultimate Frisbee and then kind of came back into the road racing world and uh, just started tearing things up. And she's been to multiple um, world championships on the road since her name is Sasha Gaulish. Um, but yeah, she credited a lot of her success after that from like the ultimate Frisbee. And I did play a little bit of ultimate Frisbee when I was in Dubai and uh, it's, it is a ton of running and very intense, mind you. And people do take this sport very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a lot of friends who I um, play with on my university team that play competitively or are semi-professional in the, the league they have going around in North America. Um, I compared a lot to soccer uh, in terms of like the motion on the field. I was a cutter. I wasn't very skilled with throwing it. So they kind of just like said Isaac run and go go catch it. I was like basically a dog, or if I dog. Um, but a lot of it is just kind of cutting back and forth in interval training. So um, nice when like those background pieces kind of form and mesh together kind of into what you're passionate about now. And during the time, it's just playing and having fun. So mm -hmm. that, that kind of kind of works to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Kind of subs in is almost like speed work, doesn't it? Like if you're constantly doing that cutting and back and forth and yeah. cutting out, cutting deep, and then coming back and like there's very set plays in Frisbee. Like you're often in a line or starting a line and you kind of like divide and conquer. So uh, a lot of it's kind of sprinting and then kind of jogging back into your position in line or cutting your line. So, yeah, I've never, I've never seen this. Is it actually like, uh, is it contact? Is, is ultimate first be contact? No. Hmm. Um, perhaps it should something. be. Yeah. It'd be a more in, enjoyable or to watch perhaps, um, or maybe to play. Um, well, isn't it? It's always co-ed though, isn't it? Oh, okay. the The league that I played in Dubai was co-ed, so there would be no <laughs> contact. Yeah, in our league. yeah. They have like inter intramurals in university. You can have co-ed teams, but for like the some schools have varsity. Sometimes it's called competitive club. It's mostly just um, a girls and a boys team. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I would be terrible at. I can't throw a frisbee worth of crap. Remember when they had? See, users before you, but they had the frisbee frisbee at uh, Spartan Duntroon. Yes. One of the obstacles. Golf. Oh, cool. And now that was before you. And I don't think I've ever seen so many burpees as Frisbee golf. And then it was right before the spear throw, too. So it was like back to back, smash, smash. It was the worst. Everybody, everybody failed it. And the Frisbee golf disc is a lot flatter uh, and smaller. So it's even harder to throw than like the typical Frisbee you play like outside with your family. Ah, man. Every time I threw it, I would hit the post in the middle and it bounced out. I didn't get the. Yeah, a little too aggressive. Yeah, and then it was the next year where they had they had it on the map with a little mm -hmm. asterisk, and then underneath, very little on the map, it said "just kidding." <laughs> nice. I actually took it out. So I Johnny Wait with a bit of sense of humor. Took too many souls the year before. Oh, it's terrible. So you're doing well in your Spartan races, um, and then would it be safe to assume when they kind of changed the format? Is that when maybe you decided to pivot a bit to try some hybrid stuff? Uh. 
yeah mostly i mean i'm interested in the 3k i haven't done any um it kind of just didn't fit with my my timeline of where i was going so as i mentioned before i was in utah so it didn't really fit with my travel plans um at the time i was pretty passionate oh i still am passionate about um enjoying trail runs and out in the mountains and outside and um i'm not really one to run around a track and uh work on my speed as much uh as many other people are uh are willing to do that so uh, it didn't fit with where my passion was at the time. I have nothing against it. I'm pretty new to the scene of OCR, so I don't have the nostalgia of the old time OCR compa- to compare it with. So um, there's nothing against like the change format. Obviously, it sucks for people who have dedicated a bunch of their uh, years to a specific kind of tougher beast uh, and super distances. But uh, I'm, I'm willing to try it next year, potentially, if it fits in with my calendar and I can get up to a race. Um it just more so didn't fit like this summer, um, like this year in general, it just didn't fit with me graduating and then moving out to Utah. I just had a lot of things going on. So I didn't run as many Spartan races this year. Um, I hit the Toronto one, just the 5k on my way. Cause I drove to Utah. So I hit it on the way and then continued on. Uh, and then I ran the Utah beast and, and super, but other than that, I haven't, uh, raced any Spartan races. I don't think this year I'm doing the North of seven in two weeks time. So oh, that'll be awesome be my next uh obstacle course race yeah my dad and my uncle did it last year and they loved it like the axe chopping and this oh, very, very, oh, very we there last year oh awesome yeah so uh they, yeah. They, were, they were hyping it up and i'm i'm excited to try it a couple weeks you know it is it, it is it is grassroots ocr as it should be as it started out as it was great um we both went bethany cleaned house last year she won both distances I, um killing it it was really good like they they have a nice little festival area. Um, they had food, they had beer, little nice 3K course. And the way they did their multi-lap system worked really well. It was really basic and really simple, and it just worked. So I expect yeah. more this year. I'm going to volunteer in the morning. I reached out to them, and they, they need some volunteers. So I'm going to volunteer for the morning and watch my dad compete, or watch my dad finish at least. Uh, <laughs> I'll take off around, I don't know, an hour or half an hour before like the two hour race. And then I'll go race that against whoever's there. So I'm excited. Oh, well, there you'll was some probably, good... uh, you'll probably be racing Jesse Bruce, I assume. Nice. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's, it's a very, a very big one army academy thing. There will be a lot of them out there, I think. And it'll be some good competition. It'll be a good fun run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. It'd be nice to have some competition. I haven't raced Jesse this year. So nice to uh, throw down with him. Well, we were just looking before you came on, and we didn't notice that your deck of time is about a minute faster than his. Yeah, but I mean, he did. <laughs> it, it wasn't an official deck event, right? Like, it, um, I'm sure there's uh, some stations that were set up faster or slower. It wasn't like the one of the classic kind of set up ones by Yancey and his kind of roadshow crew. So, um, as of it right was, now, it was in uh, the pouring rain. Yeah, so like that. <laughs> I'm not going to compare that. I'll, I'll take it for now, and if he. Or if I need to use it as ammunition, I'll use it. But um, yeah. I, I'm going to throw down a faster time than the 32 uh, mid that he ran before. Well, we were, well, Beth, so what was your, what was yours at the road show? Uh, 37, 17. 37, 17. So you were almost a minute faster Yeah. at this yeah. one or almost, a, yeah, almost a minute faster. So we kind of figure actually in actuality, if you guys were on the same course, it would probably be a really good race. And yeah. Be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, well, we should get more Canadians down there because it's uh, it was lonely. I, I mean, Bethany experienced the same thing too. A lot of a lot of American flags and one one little lonely Canadian for the men. Yeah. With <laughs> well, nice, yeah, gotta get some more people out. The problem was you were too fast for your relay, right? You had too fast a partner. In the next wave, we were all in the next. It was like the Canadian wave. Mm-hmm. There yeah. was there was tons of us in that one. But yeah, we'll go yeah, through that later. So when you moved to Utah did like why the move to utah what what inspired that because that's a bit different coming from there to here or here mm-hmm. there. yeah so uh i graduated in april with my engineering degree and i just wanted some time off i'd worked uh, for 16 months full time like in between my engineering degree to accumulate some time towards my my png um so i just wanted to take a summer off and not have to worry about uh work and kind of do some traveling and feed the soul a bit uh, and Rylan, is that, everyone here knows Rylan, um, had a room open in his house and I'm good buddies with him. So I just asked if I could, uh, come live there for the summertime and he said, yeah, no problem. Um, so I went out there, I guess the middle of May 
and I just left. Like I flew from Utah to come to PA to run the deck of fit. So I was out there the entire summer. Um, the first kind of three quarters of it, I was just enjoying um, the mountains. Obviously, we don't have very many mountains over here in uh, eastern uh, Canada, but uh, just enjoying the mountains, do some trail running, meeting some new people, um, doing some climbing, uh, feeding the soul for a bit. And then I'm, I'm actually moving to Portland in uh, October um, to work full time. So uh, back to um, real life very shortly here. Was it was it Rylan that got you interested in going to hybrid, or was this something that you 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 decided on your own? Because I mean, Rylan uh, is obviously very good. He's got he's got the record time. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was um, my own volition, but definitely encouraged by him to try something new. Um, I, I I watched a couple. Actually, I've, I've watched most of the live streams of the um, races from, through OCR Report, but. Um, I never really wanted to do inside races. I was kind of, my heart was more in outside racing and uh, enjoying that. So uh, I watched one, I think I watched the North Carolina one and I was like, you know what? I should just try one of these things. I only had two opportunities to do it this year. So that was Philly or Orlando. Um, so I said, well, like, let's just, let's just train for Orlando one. And luckily it, it doesn't hurt to have the world record holder uh, as a roommate. So I, I put a bit of uh, um, his programming. I think we started on our August 3rd, um, so I had about three weeks to kind of transition my mountain, my mountain fitness into some sort of compromise running. So, uh, it was quite funny. This isn't verbatim, obviously, but one of my, or my brother after the race said that the commentator said, I must be a runner. Cause I had a heart rate monitor on like, a heart strap monitor, and I was at the slowest 5k time. I was just like, I was not the runner in the field. Um, but I, I just need to work on my compromise running. That's just the, I, I haven't trained that uh, as much as I, as I should. So um that will hopefully come down in the near future did you use the heart rate monitor during the race because like i i mean obviously i was i was out there doing the rabbiting i saw you a couple times and chat mm -hmm. with you a little bit and then be like you were running like a really tactical smart race it seemed yeah yeah i so i, I got two simulations uh like deca sims in prior to race and i used my heart rate monitor both times and kind of just uh geared my race and my strategy off my effort and my heart rate response um, obviously it's not perfect because running doesn't translate perfectly to like, there's breaks, obviously, right. The farmer's carry isn't the same, but uh, I wanted to kind of pin my heart rate at a certain, um, number for the first two, uh, so the, the first two laps, the first station, and then the second lap, just to make sure I wasn't overdoing it. And I looked down and I'm way above my number. So, um, the plan went to shit pretty quickly, but, uh, the plan was, the intention was to follow the heart rate for about the first eight minutes to make sure I didn't overdo it. But I looked down after like the, the rower and I'm like, oh, I was at like 178. I'm like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't going to plan. So I, I aborted that mission and then I just kind of went on RP. I tried, I tried to recover some more on the runs, but um, yeah, I, I attempted, but not successfully completed the heart rate uh, um, plan. That's interesting. Cause when, when I finished my race um, and I was behind Carly Wopat and she was like, Oh man, I threw my heart rate monitor off somewhere and I got to go find it. So I don't know her race strategy, but it sounds like maybe she was trying to monitor her heart rate also, and then just ended up throwing it away too. So I don't know if that's kind of a, a hybrid thing, but right. yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's, if it's completely applicable just because your heart rate varies a bit just on whatever station you're on or running portion. Um, but I did have like memorized going in, like what my heart rate was for each station during the sim. So I could at least like look back and see if I was overdoing it. And of course, every time I looked at it, I was overdoing it, but, um, compared to the sim, sim at least, but, um, yeah, it was, it was a good, good first crack at it. Some things to work on, uh, obviously as everyone that does, but, um, I enjoyed it. As a, as a rookie race, it's normal. Normally what you see out of people's rookie race is it go super freaking hot. Mm -hmm. And then they, by the time they're done the rower, they're like, I have made a giant mistake. So to see you be a little more tactical, that's where it was. I probably, that was probably the most impressive part was that, you know, you're a young guy, first race, first decade, and you were very tactical about it and very smart. Um, is that normal for you? Like, is that the way you normally race or like do you Spartan race, you go haul out? Like, is this, is this kind of a, this a typical strategy? Well, thanks for saying that. that. That didn't how it wasn't how that felt. Like, I didn't feel like I was running. <laughs> I just described it because um, I was I was the fastest on the rower. I had I think I had the second fastest lunch time, 
um, the fastest step over time to or tied for it. So I, I didn't feel like I was um, going out easy or like I felt, I felt like I was going out pretty hot. Uh, and then I just took the the run time to recover. And I think I need to change that strategy to be a little more concerted on the stations and actually push the runs a little harder. Um, cause I was, I was comfortable being caught on the runs cause I knew in my stations I was just going to push harder. Um, but I think I might flip that strategy next time, but to answer your second question, uh, I am a pretty methodical person. Like I'm, I'm in the engineering field. I, I'd like to like crunch numbers and, uh, think things through, um, before I do them. So I think it's pretty on brand to, or on brand for me to, um, kind of game plan and try to be a little more methodical and tactical about how I race. Obviously, it doesn't always go to go to plan, and sometimes you have to make some mid mid race ad adjustments. But um, the intention is always to try to conserve energy and then not fade as much as possible. Although, I mean, it's I, I usually do fade at some point right, compared to some other people. So the intention is there. Well, I, I guess on this one, most of the time that I got to be near you or saw you or whatever it was during your recovery process because it was on the run and that's what i mean so to me i get to spend some time near just about everybody during that and to me you seem like one of the ones who was in control and not overdoing it so that's why it brings me to the you didn't yeah. go out too hot i appreciate all the support on the course it's nice <laughs> to have a friendly face just to remind you to stay in it and uh and keep going so i appreciate that uh, that support you know how frustrating it is because you want to tell people stuff when they're going like like so and so is thirty seconds behind you, or this or that, and, and you and you can't really do that. You're not, or you shouldn't, because yeah. it's not a fair advantage to to everybody. But, but yeah, yeah. Well, hard to do. Or and and whenever faculty that comes in, so thank you so much for that. So you did the race. You ended up coming fourth. Is did that surpass your expectations? Is that what you figured? Did you did you hit your goal time? Yeah, the so the result wasn't more on my or wasn't on my mind. I wasn't really going for a place. Um, I was going for a time. I wanted to um, break thirty one, so that wasn't. Uh, but the a goal was like thirty forty five because I think I don't know who has thirty forty six, but someone has thirty forty six. So I, I wanted to break that, be comfortably in the top ten. Um, and in my sims, I was always kind of high. My sims were like thirty one twenties, I think. So pretty accurate to how how I ran. Um, so I didn't reach my, um, uh, my time goal. My B goal was just to get in the top 10 and that's where I sit right now. So that's awesome. But, uh, I didn't have many expectations for, uh, placement. Uh, I knew that there was some pretty strict or some pretty good competition. Um, Dylan being there and Rich and David and Nick, um, Jared Newby, like there's a bunch of people who are, um, really talented athletes. So I, I wasn't really going to worry about stacking up against them and, um, trying to place myself before the race um if it came to like the last run and the burpees like it like it did i just knew i had to just push it and see where i ended up um but overall for the the, the first race i felt really happy and figured some things out on the way and can look back at the results and look back at the race um footage footage but also the split times and um pick apart where i think i can go slower or faster um but yeah overall i'm, I'm pretty happy with uh, the first the first attempt at it did you know you just bumped Rich into the second wave, put him into eleventh, and did you did you let him, you should let him know? No, I didn't let. I, no, I didn't let. This was. Uh, I will. I'm not going to dis. <laughs> oh, I think yeah, he's actually tenth. I think because I think Nick has two times up there under his name. Oh, okay. I think it is Nicholas and then Nick, so I think that he's still tenth. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm not gonna. Rich is a talented athlete, and he just wasn't as sharp for the thirty minutes events. I'm sure he's working on his high rock season. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm not gonna say something now and eat my words in uh in four months from now. It is funny, actually. This is very similar to how we went into last year. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He did not. He did not. I think he went in as like a seventh seed last year or something around there, and yeah. then put it all together on the right day. Yeah, well, all you need to do is get them in the top 10, the first wave, and then uh, you still have, what, 13, 14 weeks before World Championships, so that's lots of time to put in some solid work. Yeah. Had you ever raced any of these guys before, any of the guys on course? No. Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah. No, I don't think any of them have been up here, so unless you've done some Spartans down south, I don't think you would have. 
Uh, yeah, the only one I've done in the States is like Utah this year, which none of them were at. And I did Killington last year as well, but they wouldn't, they weren't there. Um, yeah, I think they were all new, which is kind of nice. Like it doesn't put a lot of pressure on, on me in terms of um, like, like placing myself in the results. That's something that I, I in the past, I've kind of looked at the, the starting line and seeing where I should be or where I, like I have been in the past and kind of overthinking that part of it. So it's nice to just be, um, like like everything's brand new there's no like certain place i should end up i just gotta go and compete and do my best and that's kind of the mental side of performance that i'm still kind of figuring out and working on but uh it was nice to have uh, a little less stress going into the race of over analyzing overthinking things so then you also got into the relay now you when did you and julie decide you were going to team up um probably around August 3rd when we did the first sim. So Julie lives out in Utah. So I've been training and running with her all summer long. Um, and she's awesome. Uh, she lives about an hour north of where Ryland's at. So we would travel and meet each other halfway and do like a ridge line somewhere or go down to Salt Lake City in the Cottonwoods and run in there. So uh, I've been hanging out with her and, and training with her for the whole summer. And whenever I decided to do it, um, she, she already had on her calendar. So she was going regardless. And then she just asked if we wanted to do the teams together. Um, so I said, sure. She did, she did it once with her husband, I believe. Um, I don't know where that was, but, uh, so she had some familiarity with how it, how it works and kind of coached me through. And so did Ryland obviously, but coached me through what we had to do together and do separately and what the strategy would be. So we had about three weeks to kind of game plan and prepare for it. So you guys were in there again with some, some badass teams. There were um, some really good teams. Yeah. How did you guys strategize your your race? Because I mean, the, the the relay, and we've said it before, we think the relay is the most fun, mm -hmm. the best part of it, and so much strategy, so much planning, and so yeah. many different ways to attack it. How did you guys lay it out? Yeah, well, you guys crushed it too. Um, both your teams, I think. But Bethany, you won, right? So like, yeah, me and Heather, yeah, yeah. Um, how we strategized it? Um, I don't know. Like we. We did it like we, we wanted to be pretty even. Like Julia had a previous experience doing with her husband, where her husband did stations and she ran. Um, and I think she was missing like the the station work, so we kind of just mixed it in as best we could. I did all the like the the fan um, machines or like the wattage based uh, machines. So the rower I did, um, skier and salt bike. Uh, she did some of the some of the quicker stations. Like she did the lunges, the step overs, the med balls. Um, and then we did, we split, actually, we split the ski up cause I was dying. So I wasn't supposed to, but we, I called an audible halfway through and I was like, Julie, I'm going to need you at like three fifty here just to just give, me, give me some, give me some breath. So, um, the plan was just mix it up, um, and like kind of vary our, um, like running and station work just to see how it felt when I mean, we might change it for world championships and, um, have Julie run more media stations or vice versa, depending on where our fitness is at. But um, we kind of just want to see what it'd be like if we mixed it up halfway or like kind of half and half for stations and, and running, which is a very different strategy than um, like what Kevin and, and Laura do, where Laura is an incredibly fast runner. So she runs and then Kevin's an animal. So he does all the stations. Did you get to be on the bike near him? Yeah. Yeah. I was two down from him. And I think he started like a couple seconds before me um and i started going and i could i could not I, I couldn't feel the wind but i could hear the fan just like racing beside me um and he finished i think like 12 seconds ahead of me and so like, he made up t 10 to 12 seconds and i was astonished by how fast it was like sub 20 seconds yeah so, yeah i if i fresh i i couldn't go sub 20 seconds like, i i maybe have a 28 seconds in me but i couldn't do sub 20 seconds fresh so that's pretty pretty impressive he did the same thing to me in North Carolina. He was right beside me. And I yeah. actually got a, I got started probably three seconds before him. And he was probably done 25, 30 seconds before me. Like that's crazy. I think he put in a 17 that time, a 17 second bike. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I recall looking down and being at like 13 or 12 calories. So I was halfway down um, when he, when he was done. So I was like, okay, we're, we're going to have to make up some time on the runs, which I mean, is a big, a big task with lower running. So that's that's where they kind of lost us. Yeah, they 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 have a good a good system going. Um, mm -hmm. 
so yeah, what was your overall take on the whole thing? This being your first one, like the, it was a it was a pretty good one, but um, I I loved it. Uh, I think also my mom loved it because she like the spectator, the whole atmosphere is is awesome. I think that's the one thing with the OCR or not community OCR like venues and races. It's a lot uh, more challenging for viewership, um, both through a lens or but also like on the actual venue site. So it, it's really cool how everyone can see the whole time um how stations are kind of pretty easy to pick out like the zone one zone two zone three you just go one before or with the yeah the station before so um i loved it it's a it's a cool uh a cool concept i think yancey and his crew uh all the staff all the support crew do like a great job of making the energy high there was no real hiccups throughout the entire day um I did some volunteering and like everyone, there was a bunch of different um, athletic abilities doing it. Like, I think one of the girls, uh, Yancey mentioned, had MS doing it, which is awesome. Like it's just like it's a very inclusive environment. Everyone's pretty positive. It's pretty similar to the OCR community in that sense. I haven't met many, many um, rude or, or mean people in the OCR community uh, from my experience. I'm sure they're out there. But um, yeah, I, I loved it. I think um, I'm already... Uh, yeah, I've already booked flights for uh, another one. So um, I'm excited to get back in the ring and kind of experience that again. So you book flights for another one. So uh, is that Orlando or I assume you're going to Worlds, right? You're good to go? Yeah, I'm going to Worlds. I have a brother who lives in Austin. So uh, if anything, it'll just be a good excuse to go see him and then throw down. Um, regardless of if I'm in the fast heat or slow heat, I'll, I'll go just to, to compete and, and see him. And also, I think Julie's going to go regardless, too. I think she's out of the top 20 right now for the fifth, but I think she's going to go uh, as well. Um, and yeah, I'm, I booked some flights for Orlando for a, a few weeks from now, test out a different strategy. Nice, nice. So, all in all, th- is is this going to shift your focus? Are you going to do them both? Is there other things on the horizon? What What's what, what's on the hit list? Um, There's not much on the hit list, to be honest with you. I have... Uh, like I mentioned, I'm moving, so that's going to take up a lot of my October time, just kind of settling in, moving to the States. There's a whole process with Canadian moving to the States, and luckily there's a legal team that handles the visa stuff. But once I get there, like bank account, the credit card, uh, where I'm living, uh, there's a bunch of stuff to set- settle out or to get in order before I want to commit to like pushing my training more, kind of just be in a normal maintenance phase for a bit. Um but the only thing on the actual agenda is uh, Worlds on, for DECA. And then Julie and I are going to go to San Diego to do um, a Green Beret uh, event. So it's, uh, you have to carry a concept two rower um, up and down, down a couple of mountains. And then at every three miles, you have to row 10,000 meters. So I think the, the course is like, we both, or one of us or both of us carry the rower up the mountain, at the top of the mountain, you row 10,000 meters and you traverse it. And then you row 10,000 meters and you go down and you finish with 10,000 meters of rowing. So the, it, it'll be it's just like a fun like adventure race. And those are the only two things that I have solidified on the calendar. Um, I think at least as of right now, and then I guess now um, Orlando, um, but Oh, and North of seven. So four things from between now and December, I'm sure I'll find things like local races to hop into um when i'm in portland but for the time being i'm just gonna leave it at those four uh and see see how i feel in terms of like switching focus um i really like the deck i i I think my like analytical brain um for any hybrid racing is just it's nice to have like a a standardized course that i can like compare myself to previous times over and over again and some some set metrics i can like look at look back on and see how i performed so that's a really cool concept um and like the pain I'm getting used to is like uh, I, everything like OCR hurts too, but it just hurts in a different way. Um, so yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards like the rest of this year, kind of just transitioning my focus to work on compromise running and my machine and uh, station work. Uh, and then we'll see, I guess we'll see in the new year if I'm still kind of um, on board with kind of committing full time to the hybrid scene. I should do a high rock one of these times or one of these days too just to see what it's like. Maybe I'll, I'll find a bit more passion for that. It's a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, I, I think overall my, my experience is really good um, this first time. And it's kind of made me um, a little hooked to, to chase more faster times. Any thoughts to jump in on a strong or a mile in before worlds and see if you can get in there. 
I've been trying to find like so I have the ninth I'm busy with the the north of seven, the sixteenth yeah. I'm end up for another fit. Um and I think I have the twenty third or twenty fourth, so I'd have to do it the following weekend. There's one I think in Milton. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll be at that. That's the that's the one you guys okay. Uh, I'm I was thinking about doing that. That's a strong though, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm considering doing that. I don't think it was an opportunity for me to do a mile. Um, I'm going to Ottawa this weekend, uh, so I don't have a free weekend other than the 23rd to do it. Uh, so maybe the mile, but I won't, sorry, I made the strong, but I won't have time to get the mile in, unfortunately, this year. Maybe uh, maybe next year I'll, uh, I'll have some time to throw it in. But Well, you jump down to Strathroy in October and set a set an early mile mark. We're, yeah. Well, we're in, it's in London. London, sorry. Yeah. Oh, wait, sorry, the, the mile or the strong? Mile, uh, no. I'm hosting a mile in London, Ontario, October 14th. Uh, I'll be on by then. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll be out west in Oregon by then. Mm-hmm. All right, so cool. Um, anybody you want to shout out, or anyone you need to, you know, thank or sponsors? I don't know if you got any sponsors there. No, no, just uh, just me, myself, and I, and some support support from my family every once in a while. So no sponsors, but uh, big shout out to Ryland for. Um, I, I obviously I, I can't disclose what the, the the actual workouts were, but he he has a pretty pretty good um, program set up for his athletes and for for me obviously. So shout out Ryland for the mental support, but also the the workouts and programming. Um, and yeah, that's about it. That's about, that's all I got to shout out. Just Ryland and everyone who was there supporting me and cheering me on. Um, all the people I met, um, everyone's really great, and I have a, got a bunch of messages this weekend from a variety of people. Just kind of congratulating me or, th- or uh, like thanking me for cheering them on while I was volunteering. So um, I love this community and uh, I appreciate everyone reaching out. And I'll, I try to get back to everyone as quickly as I can. The volunteering is always awesome. You always get great, great people when you volunteer. Yeah. It's a good experience too. Like you can kind of see what people strategize and what they do for different, uh, for different stations. So it's a win-win. Awesome. Beth, you got anything else for Isaac today? No, thanks so much, Isaac, for coming on. And uh, as always, we love to showcase our Canadian athletes out there um, and especially coming into the hybrid scene. So um, congrats again on a phenomenal performance this weekend. And we look forward to seeing you at Worlds. Thank you. I appreciate you guys too. Great work this weekend. Mm -hmm. All right. So now don't go all quiet and shy now. All right. So talking high rocks. So the sleds, the sleds right now. And we were, we were going to talk about this, but now we got into it with Isaac after we were done our recording. Now we said, screw that. We're back in it. Um, so the sleds in Australia, they had this thing in Australia. And as a general rule, Beth, what would you say a decent sled time for most high rocks would be? And let's like, say for men under like three good push, like yeah, under three. Push. Yeah. Right around there. So yeah. people in Australia were doing like one minute 20, like half the time. The sleds have wheels. or like someone vaseline the vegemite on the bottom of them yeah vegemite that adds to the slippery factor but yeah i mean it's and we've gone on at this at length this is why you can't use time qualification base for anything for high rocks even for the majors because now if you think about it i bet you and because i haven't even looked at i haven't looked at numbers we've been too busy but Tara Jackson's probably knocked out of the top 15 by someone over there who was on a one minute sled. You know? So, so what's the big difference then between like, obviously deck is pretty standardized. You can, can go from venue to venue and it's a pretty similar time. Like example, Nick Riker this weekend ran three seconds faster than his previous one. I don't know, three or four weeks ago. So it's pretty standardized. What's the difference between the sleds? Like why isn't it the same like quality sled, same, like, is it concrete? Is it turf? Like what's the difference? Yeah. It's so interesting because we haven't really been totally able to nail it down because apparently like they bring this, like the carpets are the same and everything, but what the biggest, what the only thing that we've really noticed is the, the poles that you push can be different lengths, but the weights themselves, some are, are like a smaller diameter. Some are wider, which like, um, focuses the weight in a smaller spot um like we had no one's really been able to narrow down i don't think why in in europe and now australia why they're that much faster than uh the american sleds except the 
The only difference you can see is the diameter of the weights and maybe the carpet. It does seem that the newer the sleds in the carpet, the faster they go. And as they get older, they slow down. That okay. seems to be the way. Um, but I'm a whole minute and a half slower. Like that's a yeah, pretty big. It's, 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 right. like, I saw videos. I didn't get to watch the live stream, but I saw, saw videos and people looked like they were almost running with them. And when you go back to High Rocks, when they first came to the States, like the one in Miami, Corinna Coffin was nine minutes. Corinna Coffin is one of the most powerful hybrid athletes there are. And she was nine minutes. Now she had crap mm-hmm. shoes or mm-hmm. bad shoes, bad shoe choice, but still people were five minutes, six minutes. It was it, you would move it 10 paces and have to stop and rest. And the Australian ones, they looked like we were running across the thing with them. And it was like that Spain. Spain is notorious for that. And it, so anyone that's raced, uh, that raced in Australia, that's raced in the States or raced in Europe that like they, they can compare the times to? Uh, I mean, the only one would be uh, with Chris Woolley. Okay, yeah. So he's raced in the States and he's raced in Europe, I presume, if he was in the top 15. Yeah. Or what are his times like? I don't know if you've seen it or not. Well, actually, like, I don't think Chris Woolley's been in the top 15. Okay, maybe, first, maybe the first year. Either way, but it was a it's fast. A, it, was, yeah. it was a faster time for him. He was a sub sixty for him. I think it was his first sub sixty. It was, and then there's other factors too, like the layout of the courses are mm-hmm. baffling sometimes. Huh. But we always say this because we don't want to keep slamming on high rocks because they do so many good things. Like, well, they're the presentation of the event is great. The the actual yeah, like it, the equipment's awesome. Everything is really well done. It's just if they would get off this obsession with time-based qualifying and just have who wins and who play, have, you know, performance based on that day, you know, head to head, have that be the qualifying, there would be no controversy. And it wouldn't matter how you set up the course. And it wouldn't matter if you had one minute sleds or five minute sleds. It's just, you know, because fair is fair. Everybody's using the right same thing. So I think athletes prefer that. I think there's like some like, and for Decker, for example, I think, like at least for me personally, there, there's some benefit to having a time that I can compare myself to to previous effort where I've improved or grown. Is that the direction that that they should be going, or do you think they should try to standardize it more, like Decker has? Yeah, I will. I that's a good question. I like I like time based because what the 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 placement um, qualifying means is you have to attend certain events and that Mm -hmm. really that forces athletes to define their schedule and again we're like hybrid athletes we're all kind of like we like to do a mixed bag so when you tell people you have to be at this event and right now with high rocks you have to be at two so and so you're defining now people's schedule um so I like that DECA is time, but in order for High Rocks to really do that properly, you have to have a defined um, course setup. And that's what DECA does well. The setup is always exactly the same. High Rocks is always dramatically different. And then, so the rock zone adds time, even things with like the confusion with laps and where things are. And sometimes these things are super confusing and it is not unusual to mess up your lap counts um or you know even even do stations out of order because things are never the same um so that's where hierox uh is just so different than deca um because everything is always different so when you're defining things by time it makes it really really hard for hierox because all courses are not created equal so i don't know what direction they want to move in but if they're basing things off time um, they really probably do need to narrow down their defined course. Right. And then have that transferable to all these different venues across the States and uh, Europe and yeah. Australia. Problem becomes, and this is where they struggle, is the footprint they need for their for their event. Because they'd like to do, <clears throat> they prefer to do two laps. Two laps of a 500 meter course, essentially. But the footprint is so huge. So yeah. it limits where they can go. So then when they go to these other venues, because I'm they're a business, they're like everyone, they're trying to get good venues, good deals, right. good make money. So then they get to smaller venues or odd shape venues, and the course changes in in shape in the amount of laps and everything. Like this one in Australia, you had to exit the building and go into another building to do the wall balls at the end. It was yeah, it, 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 yeah, yeah. Huh. 
And okay. even when they had one back in New York, I mean, it was a crazy weird key shape. Like you had no idea what was going on. Glasgow was like that too. It just, what they needed to do, and they still could, but they're not gonna, is they need to go back, take their thing, shrink it, and make it like they did at the World Championship. Make it four laps every time, right? Mm-hmm. Same thing every time. Make the layout the same thing every time. And then they're going to be closer to it. The sled thing is kind of a mystery. Mm-hmm. But I think in order to make it work, they would probably have to change, I would say, essentially the the carpet itself, which is very costly. The suggestion I made was to actually put a different set of sliders underneath the sleds that could be replaced mm-hmm. so that you could actually put the slider instead of putting carpet on the ground, put sliders on the sleds and you could actually put it on the concrete floor or whatever the floor is, which most of the convention centers that they run and have. So then you're not killing the floor and, and so on and so forth. But they don't. High rocks makes change very slowly. Yeah. If well, yeah. Don't. And, and well, yeah, they're I obsessed. So. Yes. Yeah. They're... Sorry, say that again. That's not a bad thing sometimes to progress slowly. It's just a, like people are like 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 immediate change and like we're wired kind of to have like immediate responses. Um, but I think oh like better not not better decisions, but more more times than not the right decisions made like without overstepping with like kind of progressing slowly. So maybe just it's a couple years away from from getting to a position where they're time based. Maybe they need to do something in the interim. Like you suggested to have like certain races that you can qualify from, um, which I, I think they're doing something like that. I'm not familiar. Like, yeah. So, so the, right now the system is there is, uh, I think it's six major, no, five major races. And from those major races, the top three people qualify, right? So the positioning top three people qualify, but in order to race in those major races, you need to either have an existing qualifying spot from last year or a time-based qualifying spot. So gotcha. Okay. I have constantly been pushing that these major races and this, I mean, we've been doing saying this for two years, I guess now should be open and just let anybody run them. And then that way it's fair. It's even it's, or it's as fair as it can get at this time. I don't see them being able to standardize their courses the way DECA has. I think, I don't know why it's not seemingly possible, but it is between the layout of the running track and the sleds. That's what seems to get in the way. Right. Unless they condense, like they have more laps Mm -hmm. uh, and they kind of scratch all the previous like world record times and say, this is a new course from here on out and like kind of restart for their, their whole system. And like, who cares about world record times anyway? Screw it. And it doesn't matter. And some people do. Some people look like people who are top end, but I don't know. I don't know if high rocks is, uh, most companies aren't designed for the the, the top end there. Um, like that, that isn't like what's pushing the sport. I mean, no, no, it's 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 the the middle eighty percent that push the sport. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll we'll see where they go. But I mean, and in, I'm glad they expanded Australia. I mean, they're growing. That's awesome. You get more people out there, more people competing. That's fantastic. And Just, now to the Middle East, Dubai is this weekend. Yeah, yeah, Dubai is this weekend. I know Ryan Kent's heading over there. Um, I'm yeah. not sure who else. Or Weeks is going. Oh, and Mikhail, Michaela's coming down. She's going. Mm-hmm. So it'll be it'll be a good competitive event, and that that's for sure. And you know, Dubai, they always they know how to put things on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so there's a lot to like. There's a lot to like. There's really just for me. That's that one frustrating thing that I think they could be so amazing if they would just clean that up, and then it would be great. And it's always unfortunate that it's one thing or like, and a lot of times it's just one little small detail that um, people like us or media that kind of latch on to was a narrative when these companies are doing great things like Decker is doing awesome like the whole great games experience people have talked about how like it was the burning of their hands kind of overshadowed like the event yeah. which is super I think that overall the event was awesome and like, everyone I've talked to had a really positive experience barring the, the hands situation but um yeah, not trying to shit on high rocks. I haven't, I haven't tried it, so I have no no um, negative opinion of them. I just kind of kind of wanted to see where they're at in terms of standardization and why it's why it's different from from that that deck of system that's going on. Yeah, like we we love high rocks. We love I love the people with Mintra and they're all great. It's mm-hmm. it's almost like 
when you have a kid and you love your kid and you just wish they'd stop doing this one stupid thing. <laughs> and, and that's what it's like, you know, it's, you know, we love them, but for God's yeah. sake, clean up your room. Like, that's it. That's, that's <laughs> all. Yeah. And then that's just like the sticking point. Cause that's the thing that's like bothering the majority of people. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's the deal with high rocks. Interesting. Okay. Good to know. I'll have to look at those times from those Australian races and see, uh, can so so compare those ones to just any race from the states okay i'll do that and then they have split times too that you can like break out yes. and see mm-hmm. they have a great website very good for split times very very good for all your stat tracking and and uh then doing your math it's oh it's it's a total geek fest it's fantastic yeah. i'll love that okay yeah definitely awesome all right we're saying bye again <laughs> bye. <laughs> bye. thanks so much Isaac. yeah um,